climate scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences here at CU. Um, as someone who researches the climate and ocean of the northernmost Atlantic Ocean, I'm excited to hear from this session speaker, John Houston, who is familiar with the ice and the ocean of poles at a much more hands-on and skis-on level than I am. Uh, John is a professional polar explorer. In one form or another, he has been guiding since 1996. He started his career with a Voyager Outward Bound School in northern Minnesota's Boundary Waters as an instructor and sled dog trainer. That's where he fell in love with good expeditions. He has completed expeditions to Canada's Ellesmere Island, to the North Pole, to the South Pole, to Baffin Island, and through Greenland. Um, John lives with his family in Ethens, Illinois, where he works at Northwestern University managing Project Wildcat, which is a student outdoors program. Um, he's also a motivational speaker, safety and logistics consultant, and wilderness guide. Uh, most notably, John and his teammate Tyler Fish were the first Americans to complete an unsupported expedition to the North Pole, starting from Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Archipelago in March of 2009. Unsupported means that they only traveled under human power and that they carried all of their gear from the start to finish without any resupplies along the way. At the start of their expedition, Tyler and John each carried 316 pounds, either in the form of clothes and skis or behind them. Um, of those 316 pounds, about a third of that was their food. Um, and in the, this is the most, I read the book recently, and in, uh, my most favorite fact was in the last few weeks of their journey, uh, they were consuming upwards of 7,000 calories per day so that they could um, make it to the North Pole. Um, they were consuming deep fried cheddar cheese, chocolate truffles, deep fried bacon, pemmican stew, and chunks of butter. Uh, over the course of their grueling 55 day expedition, they snowshoed, skied, and swam their way to the North Pole in temperatures as low as 60 to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the success of this historic expedition can be attributed to their careful planning as well as to their teamwork, optimism, and humility. Um, John will be have a couple of copies of his book for sale if you're interested in reading more about it. Um, so please uh, welcome me in, uh, join me in welcoming John Houston. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for the nice introduction, Elizabeth. I'm glad you had time. To, uh, glad you talked about the food because what you're going to see is a short version of my North Pole story. And I removed the food part, so she got that. So that's great. So let me take you to day 52 of my unsupported expedition to the North Pole. My expedition partner and I are sitting in the tent, exhausted after skiing 17 hours against the wind. The temperature is near zero degrees. But to me, it feels colder than minus 40 because I've lost over 30 pounds. Our tent is pitched on ice and the ice is moving. Now think about this. At the top of our Earth sits the Arctic Ocean. Gigantic plates of sea ice cover the Arctic Ocean. Winds and ocean currents can cause those plates of ice to crack, crumble, and drift. And for, for the past week, the drift has been killing our progress. In a day, we ski 17, miles nor 17 hours north, collapse in our sleeping bags, worn out, wake up six hours later, flip on our GPSs, and realize that during the night, we've drifted four miles south. We ski 12 miles north, we drift three miles south. We ski 15 miles north, we drift four and a half miles south. We are going against the treadmill. 65 miles of ice and water separate us from our goal the North Pole. And in three days from now, our extraction from the North Pole is scheduled. This is a hard deadline. If we don't make it, we fail. In the tent, I look at my emaciated partner and I say, I just don't see how we can make it. And he says, I don't see it either. And for the first time in three years, our dream of reaching the North Pole unsupported seems utterly impossible. So I pick up the satellite phone, which looks like a big 1980 cell phone, and I dial our expedition manager. I explain the situation to her, and I tell her to send a press release to announce to the world that we are going to fail. All right, we'll get to the end of that story in a little bit. Now, I know very few of you here are going to be skiing to the North Pole. And those of you who are thinking about it, you might have just changed your mind. You may say it in starving fighting and losing battle against drifting sea ice in temperatures 120 degrees colder than this room, that sounds crazy. But challenges are challenges. And what I learned on the way to the North Pole can apply to your endeavors too, personal and professional. 
So as I'm telling you my story for the next half an hour or so, be thinking about your own life and your own goals. It is never a bad time to come up with a new goal. What is something you want, want to accomplish that you haven't gotten around to yet? Maybe it's a new direction or a big initiative. Or maybe it's something smaller and closer to home. Maybe it's something with a relationship that you have with somebody. Whatever it is, we all have something, and you might have more than one. I found that once you've chosen those goals, in order to reach those goals, in order to actually get there, you have to do four things. You have to commit to the goal. You have to prepare thoroughly. You have to believe that you're going to be successful, and you have to adapt to change. Success is about committing, preparing, believing, and adapting. By the way, this photo here was taken on day five of the expedition to the North Pole. The temperature is minus 50, but I'm warm and I'm having a good time. We'll talk about that too. The first step in pursuing your goals is to commit. You have to commit to the goal. Commitment is your foundation. Without it, you have nothing. Commitment gives you a focus. It unifies you and your team behind a common goal. When I think about commitment, I think about a down and dirty commitment to myself where I say, I'm going to achieve this and nothing is going to stop me. I'm going to prioritize the right things in my life to get it done. It took me a long time to commit to the idea of going to the North Pole. And my journey began on Greenland in the spring of 2005 on another polar expedition. So there I was in the Greenland ice cap sitting in this tent eating dinner. And over dinner, I was chatting with my team leader, a Norwegian polar veteran named Runa. And Runa says to me, you know, John, no Americans have skied unsupported to the North Pole. You should think about doing that expedition. I was like, whoa, I love to ski to the North Pole, but unsupported is the real deal. Unsupported means 100% self-reliance. No resupplies or supply drops along the way, and only using our own muscle power. No sled dogs and no snowmobiles. So I did what Runa told me to do. I thought about it. After all, on these polar expeditions, in this case, 72 days on the Greenland ice cap, we have a lot of time to think as we ski along for 12 hours a day. I was attracted to the pure nature of going unsupported to the North Pole and the idea of going on a big journey into the unknown. But I was also scared, really scared. Explorers had frozen their feet on the way to the North Pole, and some had even fallen through the ice and died. But at the same time, I knew that this was the sort of project that I've been dreaming of in one way or another since childhood. When I was four years old, I begged my mom to read me the Kantiki story over and over and over. Later on in childhood, I actually dug up the backyard trying to be Indiana Jones. I even went on to study archaeology at Northwestern University. After I graduated, I ended up working at Outward Bound in far northern Minnesota in a small town called Ely. And at Outward Bound, which is a wilderness education and leadership school, I slept outside for over 200 nights a year. And I often used stories of historic polar explorers as leadership curriculum for the courses that I was instructing. Early polar explorers were the astronauts of their time. The way they solved problems and led their teams was just fascinating to me. And the more I studied these expeditions, the more I fell in love with them. And a lot of the themes that you'll see me pull out of my story today come from, in one way or another, from these historic expeditions. So I knew I wanted this North Pole project, so one day, I just made a commitment. I said, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ski unsupported in the North Pole. Here we go. I knew that perhaps the most important and the first step would be to find the right person to do it with. I wanted to do it with somebody on my level. I wanted the partnership to be equal. I wanted to feel like we could be in the trenches together. So I decided the right person to do it with was this guy named Tyler Fish, and he's pictured here on the right. Tyler was an important figure in my life in northern Minnesota. He was one of my supervisors at, at, at Overbound. He got me into cross-country ski racing. I looked up to his wilderness skills, his athletic ability, but most of all the fact that he didn't have a big ego. So I asked him, and he was like, he said, whoa, that's a big idea. Let me think about it and talk to my wife for a while. So three months later, after some negotiations with his wife, Tyler came back to me, and he said, I'm in. So we held our first team meeting the next day at his kitchen table. And right away, we said, hey, we're going to do this big project, but we're actually fairly different people. So where are we going to start? We would have to raise over $200,000. We'd have to market. We'd have to do training. we have to choose expedition equipment, all these details. So we set out our mission. We set out our values, and we made four commitments to each other. First of all, we made a plan to regularly check in with each other to make sure that we were working together well and communicating effectively. 
Next, we made a big commitment, a commitment that no matter what obstacles arose along this big, scary journey, we would keep moving forward. We wanted to acknowledge all aspects of the endeavor, the good, the bad, and the ugly, especially the bad and ugly, because we knew there'd be a lot of hard times of doubt and drudgery along the way. Next, we made another commitment, a commitment to come back alive and to come back with all of our fingers and toes. Living in minus 60, minus 40, or 50 on the Arctic Ocean scared us. We made safety our number one priority from the get-go. And lastly, we slated our expedition to start about three years down the line and made it a long-term plan. Doing that took all the pressure off and allowed us, to, allowed us to see this huge goal as a learning progression. Looking back, we set ourselves up so well that day. We, we started with this big, crazy idea. We ended up with some values like optimism and humility. And we ended up with a commitment to our partnership, a commitment to do it safely, a set of realistic expectations, and a patient long-term plan. It is so, so important to make that commitment. Because without commitment, everything can get derailed. You risk having half your team invested, but not the other half. And without commitment, it becomes a whole lot easier to take shortcuts or quit when things go, start going tough or you encounter obstacles. And without commitment, you are not going to fully prepare. And that is essential. I like to say that preparation is the expedition. We are responsible for our success on the ice with the labor and sweat and energy we put into preparation. Pursuing your goals is just a fantasy if you're unwilling to fully prepare. So Tyler and I, we hired a trainer. We worked out with more focus and discipline than we ever had in our lives. We hit the gym for early morning weight tra training sessions and we even changed our diets. And then in order to simulate pulling 300 pound sleds, while cross-country skiing, we took it to another level. We pulled truck tires. We did this year-round for over two years. Here's what it looks like. The whole idea is to mimic the exact same motions we are doing on the ice. We want to train our specific muscle groups in the same way they're going to be used on the expedition. So we push our bodies, we identify weak spots, and we strengthen them. We don't want injuries on the ice. It's also excellent mental training because over time, our minds become accustomed to the snail-like pace and the constant exertion we'd be experiencing on the way to the pole. And doing the same motions creates what I call positive mental imprints. So that when we hit the ice, when we started pulling sleds instead of tires, it would feel comfortable. And that level of familiarity was extraordinarily important because we didn't want to think too much or become overwhelmed. We just wanted to do what we were trained to do. So for over two years, Tyler and I pulled tires with an expedition mindset. And let me tell you, people thought we were absolutely crazy. <laughs> I got questions and fist bumps and high fives from all walks of humanity. <laughs> and I get people coming up to tell me car jokes, like, dude, where's your car? Or can I ride on your tires? Or are you being punished for something you did to your wife? So if you see somebody pulling tires, please think of a very clever car joke. So all that physical and mental training was only half the work to get ready to, for the expedition. The other half involved all the work necessary to raise over $200,000. That work involved marketing proposals, a lot of networking, a lot of writing tasks, and as it turned out, very little of that work was in Tyler's skill set. So it all fell to me. I was totally stressed out and unhappy about that situation. This was not the equal partnership that we had envisioned. But at the same time, Tyler and his wife had a kid on the way, so they were very busy. He was very busy with that. But it was clear that we had a problem. So we sat down, we talked it out, and we did what we had planned to do. We, we, we came up with a solution, a solution to play to our strengths. Me being more the type A taskmaster took on the administrative work, and Tyler, being a more hands-on guy, took on all the equipment packing and equipment modification, which was a big job. It felt so good to clear the air. So after putting on 30 pounds on our frames, bulking up a little bit to inure ourselves to the cold, we flew up to the northernmost point in North America. That flight cost about $45,000. So here we are on March 2nd at the northernmost point of North America, far northeastern Canada. The temperature is only minus 40. We're happy with that, and we're also happy that it's not windy. This photo was taken at noon. Although, but you can see that it still looks fairly twilight-like. That's because we are still in a 24-hour darkness that covers the high Arctic during the winter time. The sun would come back a few days later, but in early March, there was enough visible light to land a plane on skis. 
The other end of the expedition, the North Pole, is also defined by logistics. And this is pretty cool. There's a Russian company in early April that flies up to the North Pole with huge helicopters, and they parachute caterpillar-style tractors right onto the ice. And they use those tractors to plow off a runway and open up a base station that exists for about three weeks. And that base station is used by scientists, journalists, adventure tourists, and people like us. And toward the end of April, once we have 24 hours sunlight, temperatures increase, the ice starts to break up a little bit, and the Russians pull out. And every year that pullout deadline is set in stone. So for our year, which was 2009, if we don't reach the North Pole by April 26th, the Russians will pick us up short of the goal and we fail. So we have 55 days to go from land to the North Pole. The distance is about 475 miles, but we're easily going to cover over 500 when you take into account all the zigzagging and meandering that we're going to have to do to get around ice obstacles. One of the things that we did in preparation, we looked into all the other expeditions that had attempted this route. There have been about 11 successes from different countries. We also found that over 75% of those expeditions failed. So we identified the most common causes of failure, frostbite, equipment malfunction, injury, we found that the most common cause of failure was that people simply give up. They lose the mental ball game and throw in the towel early on. They cannot envision themselves being successful because the beginning is such a huge challenge. So we knew what obstacles to, to expect, but we also knew the only way we we're gonna make it through the first two weeks was by believing in ourselves. Believing in success is that intangible thing that holds everything together. You have to believe in yourself and believe in your team. You have to believe that if you keep moving forward and you cultivate an optimistic team mindset, you will find a way to reach your goals. But it's not just about belief. It's how, how you support that belief. In our case, with setting intermediate goals by being patient in the beginning and being as a positive teammate as possible and having fun along the way. So I'm going to show you a few ways that it worked for us on the ice. Here we go. Ice Armageddon. What you're looking at here is the frozen surface at the of the Arctic Ocean. The ocean currents here create so much pressure by pushing up against land. The ice crushes and Go. freezes in place from the endless fields of junkyard life. And that's what we have to travel over for the first two weeks in a different unknown point throughout the expedition. Despite this image, the video, having a good time. In many ways, it feels just like our training. With a patient mindset, and that's the with a patient mindset, things start to be rubber and fun. I feel like I'm sitting in I come to a dead end, I stop, I look left, I look right, I clamber about, I keep the path of the least resistance for it. The temperature is minus 45 here. I'm only wearing two layers of long underwear in my winter shop. The extra fat I have on my body and the hard work to keep warm. We work really hard not to focus on the 475 miles and the hours of our day. We do this for eight hours a day sometimes and feel lucky to be in two miles north toward our goal. And also lucky to find a place big enough to put up the tent. It's all just love. Be impatient in the beginning and the big challenge. Or, st or taking on a big project. Give yourself a chance to learn and get comfortable before you step on the gas. This is the first sunrise of the season, the first sun rays of an entire year on this part of the earth, an awesome sight to be a part of. And we were really looking forward to some warm sunlight, let me tell you. But that sunlight only heated up the upper layers of air and compressed the cold down onto us for a few days. So one morning, we looked out at our thermometer, which is a $3 model that we bought at Ace Hardware. And that red needle was stuck at minus 60. It was stuck there at the bottom. We don't know how cold it was that day. We could have been a whole lot colder. We're never going to know. And for the next three days, the temperature did not rise above minus 50. Tyler and I knew we were in this crux point where so many other expeditions have quit. It seemed the challenge is just too impossible. So we came up with three expedition rules designed to keep us optimistic. We wanted to push negative thoughts away and focus on moving forward 
and focus on staying safe. So here are the expedition rules. Number three, and perhaps most important, is no complaining. Complaining is outlawed on expeditions. It makes everything more difficult than it needs to be. Number two, we like to say, hey, the body can achieve a lot if the mind will let it. Sure, this is a physical expedition, but we see the challenge as 75% a mental challenge. And how we interpret and digest everything that we can't control out there, the ice, the weather, our partner's actions, sometimes our moods, we, we try to detach from that and really focus on our own mental outlook and stay positive. And our number one rule is simply say nice things to each other which we borrowed from Runa, that crazy Norwegian Viking who gave me this idea in the first place. It sounds like something you'd say to a five-year-old, but it's true. If you can keep your sense of humor going, those hard times are not going to be as tough. And with a positive mindset and some fun and laughter out there, you're gonna have a higher performing team. And there's been so much research into this. People have been in dire circumstances throughout history and those that are able to dial into the optimistic part of the brain are those that survive and perform at a higher level. As it got away from land, the ice flattened out. We, we soon we began to cross huge farm fields of flat ice separated by fences of rubble. And the temperature started to slowly increase as did the, our, as did the sunlight, about 50 minutes every single day, if you can believe that. Soon we began to encounter leads. Leads are sections where the pans of ice have separated, revealing open water or just weak ice. And sometimes we have to ski along those leads to find a safe place to cross. So this is what crossing a lead looks like. We are about to cross our first frozen lead, freshly frozen lead. It froze last night, we're pretty sure. So look at Go my John. Here. The ice I'm across is made from salt water. If I hesitate, I'm going through. The only way to make it across is to keep sliding forward to fresh, supportive ice. I did not tell my mom how that would work before the expedition. So we were patient in the beginning. We dialed into our routines. We started to get ahead of schedule. And another way we supported our belief in success was by celebrating intermediate accomplishments. And it sounds kind of corny or cheesy to do that, but it, it really worked for us. So every time we crossed a degree of latitude, which is every 60 nautical miles or about every 70 street miles, we celebrated by drinking a little bit of scotch after dinner. Now I can tell you the scotch freezes solid at minus 40. <laughs> totally solid. So if you see a bottle of frozen scotch, you know the temperature is at least minus 40. You shouldn't play around trying to drink it. You probably got bigger things to worry about. But we really cherished that thimble full of scotch. It gave us a chance to kick back and acknowledge what we had achieved. You can see our progress here, ver going very slowly in the beginning and then starting to get some distance about halfway through the trip. Day 35 or so, we check our GPS and we noticed that we had started to drift a little bit. But we were ahead of schedule, so everything was okay. But everything was not going okay between Tyler and I. Around day 45, those negative tensions in our relationship from the preparation phase started to encroach again, so much so that we couldn't ignore it anymore. Then on the morning of day 47, Tyler snapped at me about how the food, the food was packed. And I was kind of shocked, he sounded angry. So I confronted him. I said, hey, what's going on? And then he unloaded on me. He said, you know, John, sometimes I feel like you boss me around and don't consider my opinions, and I'm sick of it. Sure, you have been to the South Pole in Greenland, but I have good experience too. You know, I knew we should have packed the food differently, but we went with what you did on the way to the South Pole, and now the food bags are breaking, and it's a big pain. At our bound, I was one of your supervisors. And now the, the power dynamic has switched, and that change has been really hard on me. And I want to tell you that I feel absolutely horrible for not pulling my weight during the preparation phase. But in holding all this in for so long has just been killing my spirit. So that's, that's the clean, very truncated version of, of Tyler's rant, but you get, the, you get the picture. I was shocked and I was mad. Why did he hold all that in for so long? I was quiet for a bit and then I said, hey, thanks for telling me all that. I know it took some gumption to do that, but we're starting to, to drift a bit more and I need time to process it. So let's come back to it at the end of our day today and we'll ski, we'll get cooler heads and, and we'll talk about it later. And he said, okay, that sounds like a good plan. So as we skied away from camp that day, I was so mad. 
Why did Tyler hold that, all that in for so long? My mind was bouncing all over the place. And toward the, about two hours into the, that first ski session of the day, I come to a newly frozen lead. I check it with my ski pole. I get a thumbs up from Tyler. I start skiing across. And then Tyler yells at me, John, you're going through. I ski faster, desperately trying to find more supportive ice. But I'm on an escalator going down. The next thing I know, I'm in the Arctic Ocean up to my neck. At first, I feel strangely warm. I move my feet and legs. If the skis come unclipped from my boots, they're going to sink 15,000 feet down to the bottom of the ocean, and we're not going to make it to the North Pole. The next thought is about my expensive camera. What is it doing in my pocket? The, 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 the water pushes through my clothing, and, and my skin begins to burn with cold. I, I awkwardly swim back toward Tyler with my ski poles dangling from my wrists and the sled floating behind me. Tyler is reaching out to, to me with his ski pole, but I don't grab it because I don't want to pull him in too. After three or four minutes, I reach the edge of the ice. I've lost all feeling in my hands and feet. I push on the, the ice edge like you do at the edge of a pool, but here the edge keeps breaking. Finally, after seven or eight attempts, I, I push myself up and out and, and ski south to supportive ice. Tyler runs to the sleds and starts pulling out dry clothing. I strip totally naked right there. The temperature's about minus 15. The wind's blowing about 10, 12 knots. It's blasting me with a flamethrower of, of cold. I'm waving my hands around like crazy, trying to force blood back into my fingertips because I'm paranoid and, and going mad about getting frostbite. Tyler helps me change into dry clothing. I dive into a sleeping bag with some fudge bars, some butter, and some, some hot water bottles and work to, to resuscitate feeling in my hands and feet. This is the aftermath. It's not the right way to do laundry on an expedition here. Tyler's, Tyler sets up the tent, which you can see in the background. And in the tent, we have a dark mood. We know we have made a big mistake. We're drifting at a higher rate now. And we know, also know we don't have enough time or fuel to burn the stoves for the six hours it would take to dry out all my clothing. So we know that we have one choice, and that is to keep moving. So Tyler, being the nice guy that he is, lends me a pair of his dry long underwear. Now granted, he had been wearing that long underwear for 35 days straight. <laughs> but I put that long underwear next to my, on next to my skin and put my wet layers over the top of that. I would need to use my body heat to dry out my clothing over the next several days. Those are some very tough days. Two days later, as I skied through a whiteout, still miserable with damp cold, my mind floated back to Tyler's rant. We'd been getting a, lo a lot better since he unloaded his feeling. I knew it was a healthy thing for him to do that, but I could also tell that he was still feeling guilty for holding everything in for so long. I wondered what we should do. I never meant to be bossy, but I knew I could be intense sometimes when I was stressed out. So a little while later, I stopped skiing, and I turned to Tyler, and I said, hey, I've been thinking about what you said the other day about you not pulling your weight during the preparation phase. I want to tell you that I forgive you for that. And I reached over and I gave him a hug. Tyler's an emotional guy. There were tears in his eyes. He told me that my forgiveness meant a lot to him. Pulling through this situation with a positive outcome saved the expedition. Looking back, there are so many good lessons in this story for me. First of all, I went through the ice because I didn't follow our safety routines. That camera in my pocket was a red flag. Normally when we come to some newly frozen ice or a lead, we take out everything that is not waterproof from our pockets and put them in the sleds because the sleds float. But we didn't do that. We were distracted from the, this mor that morning's disagreement. But once I was in the ice, we barely had to communicate. We were dialed in. We had rehearsed our ice rescue routines for years together at Outward Bound. Our actions were swift and decisive. And those swift actions may have saved my, my life. They prevented me from getting frostbite and they saved the expedition. But Tyler and I made a huge mistake. We didn't prioritize our partnership and our relationship. We never set aside times, even though we had planned in the beginning to do this, where we would check in with each other and really lay everything out on the table. The problem was we always felt we had a bigger priorities to deal with, and we didn't want to be vulnerable and try, and try to deal with what we knew was brewing beneath the surface. But it's essential to do that in the short term and long term. Thankfully, we got ourselves back on track. Another thing that saved the expedition was our ability to adapt to change. Our world is always changing. And it's a hard lesson sometimes, but change will always be there. 
You can plan and be optimistic all you want, but at certain points you have to confront reality and adapt. And, and when it really gets down to it, that means changing yourself. On the ice, we were making constant adaptations. If Tyler felt a blister for me on his foot, we stopped immediately so he could fix it. We had an anti-macho mentality about this because we knew that we had to be nimble and change when the situation demanded it. Because if we didn't do that, we would end up with frostbite, blisters, and skin infections and reduce our performance, reduce how much fun we were having out there, and sacrifice the possibility of being successful. We worked really hard to fix little problems before they became big problems. Polar bears could also be a problem on the Arctic Ocean. But luckily, we didn't see any bears, only tracks. But we did see this, the orange-coated polar swimmer, me. So by the time April rolled around, we had 24 hours sunlight, temperatures increased, and we began to encounter more and more leads. And at a certain point, the most efficient way to get across these leads was to swim across. What you're looking at is the, most, is the northernmost hot tub in the world. The air temperature is minus 20 or minus 30. The water temperature in the salt water is about 28 degrees. So it's 50 or 60 degrees warmer in the water. We get cold putting those orange dry suits on, which are waterproof and trap air. And as soon as we get into the water, we warm right up, and it's an enjoyable experience for the first five, 10 minutes. <laughs> After that, it gets chilly. So we swam 12 or 15 different leads in the final two weeks of the expedition. But we also had to make bigger changes. So there's a windstorm blowing out of the northwest, pushing the ice pack toward the northeast. We, we check our GPS one morning, and we drifted three miles in six hours of sleep. But you take that three miles over a 24-hour day, and that's 12 miles of southern drift that we now have to overcome, which is an extraordinarily high rate. It's about half a mile per hour. And we know the race is on. We, inc we increase our travel time to 15 hours a day, but it's a losing battle, and we start to fall behind schedule. And then on the morning of day 50, we get a text message from our friends, the Russians. It says, hey, guys, hope it's going well. We've decided to pull out a day early. Hope you can still make it. <laughs> and we, it just slammed us. We didn't know what to do. We just kept skiing and falling further behind schedule. And then we found ourselves in the tent on the evening of day 52, back where we started our story th this, this afternoon. I'm on the satellite phone with our expedition manager. I tell her to send a press release to announce to the world that we are going to fail. There's a pause on the other end of the line. And then she says, are you kidding me? I'm not going to let you quit. You are in no sh emotional safe shape to make a big decision like that right now. <laughs> you are exhausted and depressed. I want you to sleep for six hours and call me back, and we'll make a plan. Click. <laughs> Even though we are thoroughly depressed, Tyler and I smile because we know we've hired the right expedition manager. So we sleep six hours, we wake up and make a plan. We have around-the-clock sunlight, and we're going to use it. We're going to ski for 12 hours, put up the tent, eat a meal, take a one-hour nap, pack everything up, ski another 12 hours, and keep repeating that sequence until we reach the North Pole, hopefully. <laughs> so the first 12 hours stint, we cover 17 miles. We are thrilled. The second stint, we cover 14, and then 15. We're starting to get a, a, some symptoms of extreme sleep deprivation at this point. We sleep one more hour, and we decide to go for it. 18 miles left to the North Pole. We have about 24 hours to get there. 14 hours into that last day, Tyler starts to feel pretty out of it. He's nauseous. He's got headaches. He's just feeling very off. So he takes a few 10-minute naps right there on the ice. But we keep him hydrated, we keep him vertical, and we keep sliding forward toward the North Pole. Then around 4.30 p.m. on day 55, we check the GPS and realize that we're within one quarter mile of the North Pole. So we ski the remaining 400 yards, we unclip from our skis, we pull out our GPSs again, and begin walking in circles. It takes us 20 minutes to home in on that, that elusive point, 90 degrees north. Here it is. It's the North Pole. <laughs> it looks like any other place on the Arctic Ocean. Beautiful ice. No welcoming party, no pole, no Santa Claus. Nothing but the same ice we've been looking at. And the funny thing is, as soon as we got to the North Pole, we weren't there anymore because the ice we're standing on is moving. We got there six hours ahead of our deadline. We drank the last little bit of scotch to celebrate. We ate the last of our food. We snapped some photos, took a one-hour nap, 
and then we heard the helicopter coming to pick us up. It's a strange thing to be alone for two months and all of a sudden find yourself sitting in the vodka-soaked fuselage of a Russian helicopter <laughs> where everybody's toasting and, and celebrating and partying the fact that they just flew up to the North Pole. <laughs> so we flew to the base station, which had drifted about 80 miles in the three weeks that it had been set up, caught the last flight out of the season, which is three hour, three hour flight to Svalbard, a group of islands in the North Sea owned by Norway. And fortunately, we, we got back to civilization five minutes before the supermarket closed. So here's our hotel room upon arrival. So those are the very best Reese's Cups anybody has ever tasted. I, I guarantee you that. And what you'll see next is the most intense 20-minute nap of my life. I probably hadn't slept in three or four days because Tyler snores like a bear. So I didn't sleep much in that final race to the pole. And the first shower was also something I'll never forget. I hadn't showered in two months. I was really looking forward to some hot water and some soap. So I get in the shower, I start soaping up, and I screamed. Because the body I was washing was not my body. It was completely unfamiliar to me. My armpit was a cave. I had ribs sticking out. My gluteus maximus was minimus. I had no, I had no fat on my body. What's even stranger is I put those 35 pounds back on my frame in less than two weeks. It came back on a bit lumpier than my hard-earned pre-expedition body, but it came on that fast. So Tyler and I had a dream of skiing unsupported to the North Pole. We committed to the goal. We prepared thoroughly. We believed that we'd be successful. We adapted to change, and that's how we succeeded. And that's how you can succeed, too. So what are your goals? What is your North Pole going to be? If you commit to the goal, I mean really commit to it and prioritize, you're going to set yourself up well and focus. And then once you're, on your way, once you're on your way, if you prepare, you're going to give yourself the strength it takes to reach your goals. Preparation is the expedition. And once you're on your way preparing, you have to believe in yourself and believe in your team. Support that belief with intermediate goals, by being a positive teammate, and, and going slow and careful in the beginning. And lastly, it never goes according to plan. So that's how life works. And to succeed, you're going to have to change. To succeed, you're going to have to adapt. Well, that's how I reached my North Pole. And if you follow these four principles, you can reach yours too. Thank you. Go right ahead. So my question would be, uh, let's say you're doing this expedition again in 50 to 100 years. Um, what would that look like if we assume that there's still going to be climate change? In 50 or 100 years, this will be a sailing expedition. And so who went to the opening keynote this morning? Wow, astronauts are badasses, let me tell you. Anyway, th that's, that slide, the last slide, the 2016 heat map of the world, you could see how there, there was so much red concentrated in the high Arctic. Well, th what happens is the Earth's convection system, the high altitude winds, churn all the carbon dioxide that we produce up to the northern latitudes. It's like a, it's like a sink, and it, it increases temperature, and it melts ice. Ice is reflective. Snow is reflective. So the Arctic Ocean, Greenland, and Antarctica are like the Earth's primary mirrors. They reflect 80, 80 to 90 percent of sun energy. When that goes away and reveals dark surfaces like land or water, those surfaces absorb about 80 percent of sun energy. And you get a feedback loop where increasing temperatures melt ice, reducing the reflective capacity, increases melting, and, and increases the warmth. And it just goes wider and wider and wider. Okay, now we've got a microphone that works. 
you mentioned, here's an um, audience question. You mentioned being motivated through stories of legendary polar explorers. Do you feel a certain kinship with these explorers having experienced the same hardship and, hardship and majesty of the Arctic? Do I feel that a kinship? I do feel a kinship. I mean, the early pioneers of 100 years ago, they didn't have satellite phones. They didn't have GPSs. They didn't have zippers. All this modern technology. And they, they were so tough and probably used to a, a lower degree of comfort than we are in today's world. But to read about them and then do this myself and feel what it feels like to be on an, an unsupported expedition with high consequences, I think that mental connection is what I think I, I identify with them as most. And also, like that Greenland expedition was a, re, a rerun of the original race to the South Pole. All 1911 period food, clothing, and equipment. Maybe I can talk about that one next year. But it looked like I was in the pages of my favorite books when I looked back at our team or the images that were, was unfolding before us. So I do feel a connection there, yes. So that leads right into the next question. Um, who's your favorite polar explorer? Well, who is my favorite polar explorer? I have two. Uh, historically, that would be Roald Amundsen. He's a Norwegian. And that historic photo I showed early on in the trip was his expedition at the South Pole. He was an amazing individual, a genius of leadership and small team problem solving with limited resources. And, uh, and Amundsen was a humble guy. He was confident, but he was humble. He came from Norway. He knew how to ski. He knew how to sail. But more importantly, he, he was very, very self-critical. He constantly looked for ways to get better and then addressed them with vigor. And the other thing that made Amundsen special, and, and it goes to humility again, he was the great synthesizer. It didn't matter where the information came from. He would take the best knowledge around the world about living in the cold, driving sled dogs, navigation, et cetera, and incorporate it into his own polar exploration model, which is really founded today's polar exploration. And th that is, was just an amazing trait for s somebody of that time, when there were different prejudices in people's minds and nationalism playing into it. So I kind of modeled my career in some ways on the same methods that Amundsen used to be successful. The other one is Rune Yeldnes, the guy who gave me the, this idea to go to the North Pole. And he's a good friend of mine. He's one of two expeditions that cross the Arctic Ocean and go from land to the North Pole and back to land unsupported. So that's like the full-on historic style expedition that's not possible anymore. Okay, I've got about two questions here that ask some variant of um, what's your next adventure goal? What other expeditions next on your list? The next adventure goal, I have 11-month-old twins at home, so that should... Take, me, take care of me for a little bit. So I, am, I do have like a short career or expedition career sabbatical happening at the, this moment because of that. But I'll, I'd, I'll be back on Greenland at some point. I'd like to go to the South Pole again. I haven't committed to what my next expedition will be. My wife tells me I better get going before I get too old here. So, so another common theme in the questions are, are you and Tyler still friends? Yeah, Tyler and I are great friends still. We talk at least once a month. And that was important to us, that we didn't want to exit this expedition as enemies. And that happened throughout history. People go through this intense experience, they harbor grudges, and it colors everything about that wonderful trip in a negative way. And we had our struggles, and we recognized those as more or less a sibling rivalry, and we dealt with them. We cared about each other, we cared about achieving the goal, and, and those two things that were bigger than us, our, re our relationship, going forward and achieving the goal kind of kept us together. And so, so did writing the book together. That helped a lot. So here's another audience question. Um, can you compare leadership styles? What works for you? Can I compare leadership styles? What works for me? That, that's a big question. Uh, what works for me is a bit what I've talked about here. Mapping out a mission that people can buy into, making that mission live throughout whatever organization or team, coming up with values that are true to people's hearts and that people can identify with, like Tyler and I did optimism and humility, and then really channeling everything through those values. There's so many different decisions that are difficult to make in, in marketing, public promotion, or just on the, on the ice as well. Like, and we would, would, we would get stuck and go back to our values. So I think a leader that can inspire a team to buy into a mission and, and and a set of val values that, that keep alive, this, that they keep alive, I think, is a, is a leader that will work for me. Okay, another question. How do you go back to normal living after reaching this goal? That's a good question. 
the transition phase is, can be depressing at times because we are so keyed into a singleness of purpose on the ice. And all, all the little details about life, what to wear, what to eat, when to go to bed, all that are, are taken care of by our, our routines on the ice. We don't want to think about that stuff. We want to think about more important things, staying safe, keeping warm. Coming home, all that goes away, and we're faced with so much input and noise coming at us from different directions in the world. And sometimes opening the fridge is just so overwhelming. It sounds silly, like I did gain 35 pounds in two weeks. But it can be a bit depressing. And it's also hard to relate sometimes and talk about it because there may not be people who understand what it, what it feels like. I think people who have been in the military or focused on a, a major project where they are isolated from whatever else is happening in the world and then come back, I think I can re relate to those people. But as I've gotten more experience with it, I've gotten better at it, and I kind of set out a plan for what I want to do when I return home. And being married and having kids changes that for the positive, definitely. Okay, so we only have time for, we have three more minutes, and I think we can get two more questions in since this first one's pretty quick. How many hours a day did you drag the tires? In the beginning, we, we went about eight hours a day. We wanted to be conservative. <laughs> and toward the, oh, t oh, tires. Tires. Oh, not on the slide, okay. We get, and the tires, for the tires, it was, that's, that strength training might take an hour, and if it was an endurance workout with two tires, it might be two hours all the way up to five hours, which we didn't do that often, but we wanted to do some of that. Okay, and I guess our last question, to make sure we end on time, uh, what would you do differently with the ex expedition if you were to do it again? What would I do differently? I would take more butter, <laughs> uh, because food is the big stress for me out there. But it would be what I talked about with Tyler and I. We didn't prioritize our relationship. We talked about it, but we didn't follow through. And, and that was our, our huge takeaway. And it's really difficult, like I said, to, to expose yourself to be vulnerable and talk about issues that, that individuals or teams know exist and, and to have a plan to come, come out of that in a positive direction. It takes some structure going in and an agreement that no matter what we say to each other, it's out of compassion for the team and for getting toward the goal. So th that was the big takeaway in that department. We actually have two minutes left, so I'll ask Great. one more. We've plenty of time. Uh, do you want to go there again? I have been back to the Arctic Ocean. I would like to go back to the North Pole at, at some point. Uh, whether I want to do that unsupported or not is a big question. Most expeditions these days go from the pole to land because that is with the drift. It's a lot, a lot easier. But being out there in the Arctic Ocean, it's one of the most remote places on Earth. And, and the, just being immersed in that, that power of nature on an ocean that's moving with ice on top of it is, is just a special experience. And, it's, and I, I, do, I would like to experience the Arctic Ocean on that same level again. It's like, kind of like a wrestling match and a dance at where the ocean is dictating the pace of things. Uh, let's thank John one more time. Thank you.